serious family fallouts. My friend David, David's been a friend of mine for a, a long, long time. His daughter's life just fell apart completely. Uh, her relationship with her husband went horribly wrong. Her relationship with many others went horribly wrong. My friend David uh, went to see her. She pretty much threw him out of the house with the words, I never, ever want to see you again. Shortly after that, I spoke to David's wife and I said, how are things going? Uh, and she said to me, David has aged 20 years. And in today's parable, there are, uh, there's not one, there are two huge falling outs. Uh, this story, as you probably noticed, comes in two parts. Uh, the first part, I think, is so wonderful. It's actually too wonderful. I find it hard to apply to me because it's so wonderful. But the second half is so unsettling, I don't want to apply it to me. So you can see by headings, I've entitled the first part, Welcomed Despite His Badness. That is the story, isn't it, of the younger son. Welcomed despite his badness. Uh, verse 11, Jesus tells us there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Uh, the younger son does not like his father. The younger son does not want anything to do with his father. But younger son does like his father's money. But you only get an inheritance when somebody dies. Uh, Dad, I don't want anything to do with you. Uh, when you're dead, I won't have to have anything to do with you. So let's not drag this out. Just give me the money now and we'll never have to see each other ever again. Major surprise. Dad says, OK. Uh, in that culture, land and livestock was everything. So dad would have had to have sell up. Uh, most people think that some would have got one third of the estate. One third of everything would have been sold. Why didn't dad say, on your bike, son? Major surprise. What does younger son do? Uh, Jesus tells us, verse 13... He squandered his wealth in wild living. Uh, I, I, and we sort of know what wild living looks like. Uh, cars and cocaine and high-class call girls. Uh, not giving us stuff about mum and dad and granny and grandpa and brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces in their sad, pathetic humdrum existence back at the farm well the money ran out there's no surprise there no worries he thinks I can get myself a job I can find my feet but no he can't do that because there is a famine in the country that he is living in food shortages which means money shortages which means no jobs available for spoiled brats his only gift is writing off high class sports cars he hits rock bottom. He ends up alone and destitute and hungry. What a shambles. I will go back to my father. I'm not a son anymore. How can I be? But maybe he will treat me as a servant. I can earn some food off him. The speech he prepares, uh, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. This is more than I've messed up my life, Dad, bail me out. No, he's saying I've messed up your life, Dad. And indeed, I've gone against the whole way the universe was created to operate. This isn't a manipulative speech 
in order to get dad to feel sorry for him. This isn't a speech full of excuses. This is, I have behaved beyond appallingly. Have you noticed not many people say that? Even at a trivial level, not many people say that. Uh, I'm sorry I'm late, I got stuck in traffic. Uh, In other words, it wasn't my fault, it was the traffic's fault. Uh, I'm sorry if I upset you. In other words, well, it's a bit of a shame you're oversensitive. What does a real apology look like? A real apology is actually a question. I, I, I am sorry that I did X. I can see that I really hurt you. Please, will you forgive me? But why, why on earth? Why on earth would his father forgive him? I mean, he'd done the unforgivable, hadn't he? He'd said to his dad, it's not you I love. I don't love you at all. I just want your money. But the father's generosity and mercy and kindness and compassion is just breathtaking, isn't it? Uh, He sees his son approaching the farm. Does he go and bolt the farm gate and get the dogs out? Uh, Does he stand there and say, son, you have have no idea the misery you have caused your mum. I don't know what you're going to say, but it better be good. Does he say, no, you don't deserve to be on my farm, but yeah, you're right, I can't let you starve. Go and join the other workers and let's see how we go. Does he say any number of things that we might expect him to to say? The best robe. A ring, I'll mention that in a moment. The fattened calf, that is what you reserve for a once in a blue moon, let's gather the whole village together, once in a lifetime type of celebration. The message is so clear, isn't it? I am going to act as though none of this ever, ever happened. I am going to restore you completely. Uh, The ring, the ring maybe had the family seal on it. It could have been a signet ring. Uh, A signet ring to seal documents, to make transactions. Here's the password to my internet banking. Here's my PIN number. This is jaw-dropping mercy. This is foolish mercy. This is reckless mercy. Welcomed despite his badness. I said early on that the message of the younger son is so wonderful that I find it hard to apply to me. It it feels too good to be true. As I was preparing this week, I started to ask myself the question, how close have I come to causing the sort of devastation that this son caused? And I had to stop thinking because it just became too close to the mark. But the message is, God loves returning sons. God loves returning daughters just as much as if they hadn't caused the carnage in the first place. If if you are a returning son, if you are a returning daughter, the vilest, the most destructive, the most abusive thing you have ever done against God or against his people, he loves you just as much as if you've never done it. He loves you just as much as if you had never had that disgraceful attitude towards him. Some of you dare not believe that is true. I promise you, it is true. Part one of this story, the younger son welcomed despite his badness. But part two, the story of the elder son, 
Uh, I think the story of the elder son is deeply unsettling to us because we get the elder son, don't we? We absolutely get the elder son. He, he, he is appalled. And, and we think, yeah, from his perspective, this is not great. An elder son has seen his dad age 20 years overnight. Elder son has seen the effect on his mum and on his sisters. He's seen the breakup of the farm, the selling of the cattle, the selling of many acres. He's seen the laying off of hired workers. He's seen his dad's humiliation in the local community. And yes, he's heard the sordid stories of little brother in, in Bangkok and in Las Vegas. And what's he done? He's, he's slogged on. He's, he's done the right thing. He's, he's mopped up the mess. And this loser dares to come back. And dad is taken in by his little sob story. And he's welcomed him with open arms. No more than that, he's rewarding him. Elder brother is livid. Elder brother wants nothing to do with this. Uh, the father goes out and pleads with him, and it's not a one-off conversation, but an ongoing, repeated effort to get his elder son to come round, to get his elder son into the party, to get his elder son into his house, to get his elder son into his family. Uh, uh, but verse 29, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, verse 29, and never disobeyed your orders, yet you've never even given me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My first heading, the younger son welcomed despite his badness, but my second heading, the elder son excluded despite his goodness. It is a completely bonkers, upside-down story, isn't it? The son, on the outside, undeservedly becomes an insider, and the son on the insider becomes an outsider. Can that really be right? But see how the elder son is now talking to his father. Verse 29, look. In that culture, you would never speak to your father like that. All these years I have been slaving for you, never disobeying your orders. Is this a father-son relationship? But when this son of yours... Gosh, those are telling words, aren't they? This son of yours. He's maybe a son of yours, but he's not a brother of mine. You never even gave me a young goat, and you've now given him the fatted calf and all that that symbolizes. And yet I can see where this is going. You are, you are making him a son again. And what happens to sons? What do sons get? Sons inherit He's going to inherit my bit. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. That is the point. Up until the moment the younger son returned, everything the father owned was coming to elder son. But that is about to change. Verse 32, but, says the father, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is five. He's now alive to us. We can't treat him as though he's still as good as dead. What is the elder son going to do? What is the elder son going to do? Is he going to say, yes, dad, you're right. I am sorry that I've had that attitude. I can see that I'm really hurting you. Please, will you forgive me? 
Or will elder son stay outside his father's house, walk away from his father's house? Will his attitude towards his father be no different from that of the younger son all those years earlier? This guy is in danger of being excluded despite his goodness, despite all the good things he has done all down the years. Why is he excluding himself? And he is excluding himself. Why is he excluding himself? Why doesn't he want to be in his father's house? Because it slowly dawns on us, because he too doesn't really like his father, love his father. Certainly he doesn't love the reckless generosity of his father. I don't know if you've ever noticed this about yourself or you've noticed it about other people. Uh, But when you are squeezed, when you face real troubles and trials and tribulations, what comes out of you is the real you. The elder brother, he was under real pressure here. And what came out, what came out was bile, which was the real him. I've slaved for you. He viewed him not as a father. He viewed him as a slave master. So why did he stuck with this slave master? Because one day his father would die and he would get his inheritance And he would be free. Just outwardly he was doing all the right things. But suddenly it becomes clear. Inwardly he doesn't love his father. Certainly he doesn't love his father's generous character. He doesn't want to be with his father. He doesn't want to be part of the party. He doesn't want to be part of the banquet. This parable in two parts. The first part, the first part is so wonderful, I find it hard to apply to myself. The second part is so unsettling, I don't want this to apply to me. I I love the story of the younger son. I want independence from God. I don't want to be told what to do by him. I want pleasure and excitement from all the wrong places. And then I discover that these things don't satisfy me. These things actually damage me and they damage others. So what do I do? I cry to my heavenly father. I return to him. I find unmerited mercy. I find unexpected mercy. He blots out the carnage that I am responsible for. I love that story. I rely on that story. Me, a returning sinner, welcomed despite my badness. But the second half doesn't, doesn't half unsettle me. Because I see myself in this elder son. God chooses to save those who I would not choose to save. There are people I look down on. There are people who just get under my skin. There are people who just wind me up. Did you see the jealousy in the elder son? Jealous of what the father had given to another of his children? Did you see the elder son's anger that quickly became self-righteous anger? That became horribly bitter. Did you see the sense of entitlement the elder son had? The father owed him. Did you see his need to inflict revenge on his younger brother? He deserves his comeuppance. The elder brother was squeezed and bile came out. And when I am squeezed, what comes out of me is not as loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good 
and faithful and gentle and as self-controlled as befits one of God's people. So what will I do? What did the elder brother do? We have no idea what the elder brother did. What might the elder brother have done? What might I do? Exactly the same as the younger brother. Father, I am sorry this is my attitude. I can see that it really grieves you. Please, will you forgive me? And my final heading, uh, a most amazing final heading. The merciful father and his sacrificial son. Where is the sacrificial son in this story? Where is the sacrificial son? Well, we sort of hope that it is the elder brother, don't we? We sort of hope that it's the elder brother. But it will cost him. It will cost him to accept his younger brother. It'll certainly cost him his pride. But it will also cost him a massive chunk of the inheritance he thought was now coming totally to him. Forgiveness is always costly. Forgiveness is always costly. Now, if you say to me, I forgive you, you are saying that you are willing to bear the hurt, bear the consequences of what I have done to you without any payback. Forgiveness is always costly. So where is the truly sacrificial son in this story? It's the person telling the story. Isn't it? Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Why is Jesus on his way to Jerusalem? It is to enable God the Father to be able to say to returning sinners, I will forgive you because my son will pay the cost. Jesus is the sacrificial son in this story. And he won't merely give a third of his estate to have you back in his family. He will give his life to have you back in his family. He will pay he will, he will pay for everything you have squandered. He will right all the wrongs in other people's lives that you have messed up. He will give you his inheritance. And all of this by him dying on the cross. Welcomed despite your badness. That is you, if you are a returning sinner. Excluded despite your goodness, that need not be you. The merciful father and his sacrificial son, that would be God the Father and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I respond to such a God? Well, like the younger brother, I will return to him with with great humility. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the thousandth time. I will love him for his generosity to me. I will love him for his generosity to people I don't think he should be generous to. I will love him so much. I will love him so much that I will crave the gifts of his spirit that make me what the father's sons are made to be like. I will crave his spirit to make me or to give me those gifts of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. I will crave the spirit's work in me to make me the truly sacrificial son that the Lord Jesus is.